One of the ways that the great songwriter David in the Bible, the psalmist, encouraged his heart, stirred his heart to worship the Lord is he, when things happened in Israel that were big, that were great, that he wanted to remember things that happened in his life. You see him in the Psalms saying, uh, I will sing a new song to the Lord. What did he mean? During those times, he would write a fresh and a new psalm about the Lord and about God's great work to see in a fresh, non-rut way uh, and remember and to celebrate what God has done for him. And I appreciate so much the the mixture of new songs in uh, our singing, our corporate singing here in the church, in order for us to stir our hearts in new ways to understand old, great doctrinal truths. And uh, I don't know about you, but I always grasp for joy, especially at Christmas time. I mean, you got this incredible story, this incredible thing that you know changed everything about the whole world to, to be able to celebrate it and to enjoy it and to articulate it. It is great, great to say it and to sing it in a fresh and a new way. I'd like to preach to you the message this morning, the harmony of the birth of Jesus, the harmony of the birth of Jesus. And we're going to begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you so much for uh, being able to, to uh, take a jet plane this morning and fly over the Christmas story and to be able to, to see its great truths. Lord, help us to harmonize it. Uh, I pray that you would help us, that we would walk away from here just, um, just deeply moved by, Lord, what you have done. Holy Spirit, we can't do that on our own, but with God, all things are possible. And I pray, Lord, that you would you would do it in our hearts, that you would show us just glimmers of the greatness of what you have done. It, it is not only the greatest thing that happens in December in this time of year. It's the greatest thing that ever happened. And uh, it changes everything, Lord. It, it determines uh, our philosophy, the way that we live, the way that we think. And so stir your people, Lord. Uh, I must decrease, you must increase. And so let it be so in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Every scene of the Christmas story has a purpose. That is, when you go back and you look at the particular scenes, many of them, there's something that usually sticks out greater in that scene that is a little different than the next. But what we need to understand that it is one big narrative. It is one story. I liken it to a police officer who is doing an investigation, and he talks to many different witnesses of the scene, but it's the same narrative. It is one big story. And this morning, we are going to hear the entire narrative chronologically and hit the big spiritual points about Jesus, what is being said about Jesus in each scene. We, and by the way, we won't hit every little single detail. So don't come up to me afterward and you said, oh, you forgot that that guy moved his foot in that part of the story. No, we won't hit all of it. But in the end, what we are attempting to do, and here it is, we're attempting to see the entire story in one chunk of time and to harmonize it with one concentrated thought. And I think that you could probably bring other thoughts, but as I study through it, asking the Lord to reveal one thought for you all, uh, really by seeing the whole story, I'm going to tell you at the end what, how it harmonizes or how I see it harmonize. So we're going to do 10 scenes and a 10-word summation. So hold tight, try to hear it, and I want to ask you to do something else. I want you to work with me a little bit. Try to guess what you think I'm going to say at the end what those 10 words are going to be. As you hear each, part of the, each, each scene of the story, I will try to show it clearly to you. Scene number one, John, the Gospel of John's flyover. I invite you to, invite, to turn to each of the passages as I mention them. We'll only turn to the first. John chapter one, please. John chapter one, and I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand as you're turning there. So go ahead and stand, John chapter one. Of course, the four Gospels, Mark is the only one that does not uh, give any details about the advent of Christ. He comes right into his, his uh, mature ministry. John chapter 1, we're going to read verse 1 through 13. John's flyover, here we go. In the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus, the expression, the logos of God. And the Word was with God, now check this out, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, by Jesus. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, John the Baptist. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light 
which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Imagine that. He came into his own, that's the Jews, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to, to, get, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even in them that believe on his name, which were born, that is, born again, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You may be seated. It might surprise you that we start here with our harmony of the, of the advent. The Gospel of John, well, the reason we're starting it is because it is, u- it is unique in its treatment of Jesus' coming, because it gives a complete overview of Jesus even before creation, of Jesus being God the Word bef- from before creation, clear to him coming as the light of the world. You know, can you imagine a giant spotlight that is shining in a very dark place, but the very dark place doesn't realize the spotlight is shining? You say that wouldn't make any sense. Oh, but that's what happened when Jesus came. And in his overview, it goes clear to him being accepted personally to make you a son or a daughter of God. So we start in this harmony of seeing the whole thing by by seeing John's overview. I want to point out a big point in verse number 13 that aids the harmony. And that is that we can never be born as sons of God by any means. We can never be born as sons and daughters of God by any means that we know. Not by our DNA. If we're born a certain, you know, a certain people group like the Jews, they, that's what they thought. Not by our DNA. Uh, not by the work of our flesh. That is not by good works or religious things that we would do. Not even of our own will. That's interesting in verse number 13. Not even by our own will. We can't just decide one day, I'm going to be a, a child of God my way. We can't just want it and make it happen. No, and here it is. God has to do the work. And Jesus' birth was God humbling himself to do the work, to make you his own son or daughter. He had to do it. You couldn't do it. He had to humble himself to do it. And oh, what love and humility. Scene number two, the genealogies of Joseph and Mary. We saw the Gospel of John. Mark doesn't include anything. Here's the genealogies of Matthew and Luke. So it's the genealogies of Joseph and Mary. Matthew 1, verse 1 and 2 says it this way. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's interesting. We preach through Genesis. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob uh, begat Judas and his brethren, dot, dot, dot. Verse 16 says, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called, what's the next word? Yell it out. Christ or Messiah. Matthew begins with the genealogy of Jesus through Joseph, even though Joseph, as we all know, is not uh, Jesus' biological father. It is a long genealogy when you read it there in Matthew that goes the whole way back to Abraham. Check this out. Abraham, 14 generations to King David. 14 generations after David, clear to the Babylonian captivity. 14 generations after that to Jesus. Three sets of 14 generations. The perfect division of these 14 generations three times shows that Christ's coming was all part of God's master plan. You see this phrase in scripture, in the fullness of time, God brought forth Jesus. You see that in scripture. The deal was that it was all made out. It wasn't random. It was a master plan. He was in control of history, the history of the world, to send Jesus in the fullness of time. And what he chose, and I don't know why, sometime we'll ask him when we get to heaven, 14 generations for Abraham, 14 generations from David to Babylonian captivity, 14 generations to Jesus. It is notable that this genealogy of the perfect son of God contains public sinners in Matthew. And and what I think is very, uh, is the word misogynist, sometimes I get that wrong. I can't remember if that's something you go to a spa for or if it's a bad word. All right, so the, the misogynist part of this is most of the time when preachers preach about this thing, they only mention the notable women sinners, all right? Jesus definitely had notable men sinners in his lineage, but we always remember Rahab the harlot and Tamar the seductress in the genealogy in Matthew, but then there's David who used his power and abused his power. That sounds like 2019, you know, Fox News, to take Bathsheba by force. Jesus humbled himself to reach and rescue, the point is, wicked sinners. 
He allowed himself to be born in a line. I mean, he had to, I guess. But he was born in a line of notable sinners. Christ, he came through a family tree that redeems sinners like you and I. But the fact that he did and the fact that, it, that the Bible mentions who his family tree was, notable sinners, shows the humility of him coming to sinners. Luke also gives a genealogy of Jesus, but it's through Mary. Luke chapter 3, verse 23 says, And Jesus himself began uh, to be about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, I like that, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, because people thought he was, but he wasn't really, which is the son of Heli. Uh, the, and then the genealogy goes backwards from there. Verse 38 says, which was the son of Enos, big long list of names, and then the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which is the son of Adam, which was the son of God. That's interesting. You know, Adam was born, son of God. When the verse says at the beginning of this genealogy, the son of Heli, or Heli, we know that wasn't Joseph's daddy. And this word is actually an inserted word that can mean son-in-law, and that's how we take it. That this is the genealogy of, of Mary, not from Joseph. This is an entire, entirely different genealogy. The names don't match up at all from Matthew. It's not Joseph's genealogy, it's Mary's. Matthew's genealogy shows that Jesus fulfilled God's promise to Abraham to bless the world through his seed, and it shows the lowly servant Jesus as the second David, the perfect ultimate king that would come day rule, to rule. But, but Luke's genealogy shows Jesus way clear back to Adam. What's the point? Because the, the epistles make the point of Jesus being the second Adam from above. We even sing that in one of the carols. Second Adam from above, reinstate us with your love. I don't remember the tune. Romans 5.19 says it this way, For as by one man's disobedience, that's Adam, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So here we see a servant coming who is the second Adam in humility. Scene number three. Are you still with me? Scene number three, Zacharias and Elizabeth. I won't talk about all this, but Luke 1, 5 says it this way. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. That means that they were believers, really Old Testament believers. And they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. They're past the point of childbearing. And here's where we get really into our story that we're familiar with and we sing about. Elizabeth was Mary's older relative. The word cousin there in the phrase, it really just means relative. We really don't know that she was a first cousin. And God chose this older couple by a miracle to bear John the Baptist. It wasn't a virgin birth like Jesus, but it was a miracle birth whose preaching ministry would go before Jesus' ministry and would prepare the hearts of people for Jesus as their Savior and Lord. Do you know that no one in this whole world can accept Jesus Christ without a prepared heart? With their natural heart and their natural thinking and their natural ideas, they will never receive Jesus. Something's got to change. The, the dirt, the hard ground of their heart has to be ground up and churned up before they are able to receive Jesus Christ. Luke 1, verse 16 says it this way, And many of the children of Israel, this is John the Baptist, shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, or Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Here it is, to make ready, to make ready a people prepared for their Lord. John would come and preach to the heart of people, and his message was straightforward. Repent of your sin. Repent and be baptized to show the sorrow and the repentance and the realization of the sin of your heart. That was half of the salvation message, half of the gospel, that you have to realize that you're a sinner, that you have to understand that you're offensive towards God and that you have a heart of pride. It, your heart has to be dug up and prepared for this, the seed of the last part of the message, and that is there is a Savior. And that Jesus has come to save you. You cannot take him willy-nilly. Your heart has to be humbled and prepared. His message humbled people's hearts that they need the coming Savior. You should be picking up on a word that I'm using in each scene. 
Scene number four, Gabriel's news to Mary. The story goes on in Luke 1, 26. It says, and in the month, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent uh, from God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, uh, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee, blessed art thou among women. And when she saw it, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner salutation this should be. <clears throat> and the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. It's the word grace. We did the grace project, the charis project. This is the word. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name. Yell it out. What? Jesus. From there, Gabriel continues to tell Mary things about this miracle baby, this virgin birth. Verse 31, his name is going to be Jesus. It means Savior. I mean, he is what his name is. Savior, salvation. Verse 32, he will be great. He'll be called the son of the highest, and that is God. Verse 32, he will receive the throne of his David. He'll be king of the Jews and king of the world. Verse 33, he will have an eternal kingdom. Not just on this world will he reign. He will reign forever and ever. He shall reign. You know that, I won't sing, I won't bother you. He will be born, verse 35, of the Holy Ghost, the Son of God. So, so you've got to get the picture of this great declaration that this is the Son of the highest, this is the great God of heaven, the, the, the Prince of heaven, literally, is coming down to be born in your womb, teenage girl. She could have been as young as 13 or 14 years old. That's what t the t age period that they were betrothed. She responds in great humility. This great son of God coming to do great things was condescending. So you know, it just, just doesn't even make sense. It makes sense because you've heard it so many times, the Christmas story. It doesn't make sense to a logical person who would have never heard this story before. It didn't make sense here. What, what are you talking about? You're taking these great things about this incredible being and he's going to come to live inside my womb? That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense, you know, biologically. It, it doesn't make any sense even in a bigger way because it shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't be this way. He should come with great fanfare. You remember the humility that Mary displayed at hearing that she had, she had received favor or grace from God? The point comes screaming through, God honors humility. God comes, condescends in humility. God honors humility. The interaction ends with Gabriel telling Mary that Elizabeth, her relative, was pregnant and that with God nothing shall be impossible. And in humility, the, the scene ends with, with Mary saying, I am the handmaid of the Lord. I am the lowest girl servant of the Lord. I submit to you, be it to me according to your word. Scene number five, Mary's song. It's called the Magnificent, uh, often, because it says, my soul magnifies the Lord. It's in Luke one thirty nine, and Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. Now I'm going to time out. I'm going to do a big time out here in the scripture. The way that the grammar of the story goes, it seems like that she, okay, I'm just saying it seems like, this is my opinion, that she left immediately after the angel appeared to her. That she had, she had got, she had, she's got to tell someone, she's got to figure this out, she's got to clear her mind. She thought about her relative, her cousin, Elizabeth's house. It came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe, that's John the Baptist, leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Mary, as I said, seemed to have gone straight to Elizabeth's house. This is something that is kind of new to me. Her house was 80 miles away, people. It was a trip. It was a journey. She didn't just run across town 80 miles away. She didn't just run into the field that was in proximity, 80 miles away. After Gabriel's news, she stayed there three months. And again, this is, this is speculation, but I think, it, I think it's clear from the text that, day, that Joseph did not find out her pregnancy until she returned and probably was showing. Elizabeth begins blessing Mary for being so favored as to bear the Messiah. And then Mary responds. It's beautiful poetry. It's almost a song. Some people think that she did sing it, okay? 
It's in Luke chapter 1, verse 46. She says, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the low estate of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, for he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. Do you remember that song that we sing around here? He who is mighty has done a great thing. You know, and it ends, holy is his name. That's Mary's song. Her praise bursts out of her, rejoicing in God's mercy to save her, and God's mercy to pick a lowly, you know, sinful teenage girl to do these great things in. She was a believer, no doubt about it, but she, like us, needed a Savior. She says, my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. Yes, Mary was a sinner in need of a Savior that she, that, that she would bear, the very Savior would grow, would grow up and die for her sins and, and my sin and your sin. She then expressed her low estate humility. She expressed the mighty thing God had done in the virgin birth. He that is mighty hath done, done to me great things. She points out that God scatters. This is important to our harmony. Please start forming this understanding of what is going on. She, she points out that God, why would she say this if it were not a major thing of Christmas? She points out that God scatters the proud, but he fills the, he fills the hungry, that is the humble, with good things. And again, humility. She ends with proclaiming that God kept his promise of mercy to Israel, God's condescension, God's humility. After her third month, Mary returns to her own house to face public shame and even more disconcerting, face Joseph, who may not understand. Scene six, the angel's news to Joseph. Matthew one says it this way. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. And then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was, was minded to put her away privately or privately or in a manner that didn't cause public shame. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take thee Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost. Somehow Joseph found out about the pregnancy. The text in indicates that Joseph thought that Mary had been unfaithful when he was away at Elizabeth's house. He needed to, to make the decision of what he was going to do. He had all the rights in the, in the matter. It could either be a public shaming that possibly could extend to stoning. They were still stoning at this time. Or he could do a, a much more merciful thing, and that is to, to put her away in a private divorce, betrothal, or what we would say is engagement, but it wasn't exactly the same thing. You know, in those days was looked at as the, the same commitment of marriage. And so if you were going to, you know, if there was fornication, if there was, it was adultery, and uh, there would need to be divorce or public shaming, however the law speculated or, or specified, I should say. In our harmony of this great event, it is notable, folks, that God chose Jesus to come in a scandalous way. Okay, I'm not, I'm not using that word to be a shock jockey. He came in a scandalous birth. That, that most certainly caused public rejection of this, of Mary, of Joseph, and, and, a, and a marred reputation of this baby. Let me make, just make it a lot more clear to you. Jesus was considered an illegitimate child. You know, it's a, a swear word that we used, use now, but it is the right word, bastard. Okay, this is how God chose to redeem the world. This is what is going on here. Why? illegitimacy, humility. Are you picking up the theme yet? But just as Joseph was thinking on these things and what to do, an angel appeared in a dream and told him the real deal. He said, go ahead and marry Mary. I like saying that. Go ahead and marry Mary. The baby in her is of the Holy Ghost. Can you imagine the relief, just the whole matter that Joseph felt at that moment? And the angel told him two things while, while he was there, while he visited him, other than go marry Mary. He says, number one, G Jesus will save his people from his sins. Okay, he'll be the savior. And number two, his name will be called Emmanuel. That is, this baby is God coming to be with, 
mankind. He told him those two things. Those two things that Joseph heard don't seem to go together. Let me say them again. Jesus will save his people from his sins and Emmanuel, God with us. The God of heaven, who we have all sinned against, was coming down. And by the way, he should come down. He should come down. He should come down from, because from Adam and Eve, all of us have turned against him. The holy God, pure and perfect in all his ways, should come down. You know, I, I don't know if there's ever been a more sinful time than now, to be very honest with you. We like to not look at it, but it's, you know, even our country is in crazy chaos. You know, it's the opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. If you want to see what our leadership of our country is, the chaos that we're in, you know, just look at the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, and do the opposite. And you have even our country. What about the entire world with wars and threats and poverty and abortion and starvation and human trafficking? It should be a manual. He should come down, but the reason that he should come down is to judge us. And why it doesn't make sense, the two things that he said, is that he he didn't say he was coming down to judge us. Joseph could have understood that a little better. It says that he's coming down to save us from our sins. (laughs) What? He's coming to save those who turn against him, those who look at the commandments and turn the opposite way and do what we want in our heart. He's coming down to save us, yes. What condescension and humility. Joseph raised from the dream, and he took Mary as his wife. He had such faith and respect for the truth of who this was, you know, God in the flesh, that the Bible says that he did not have relations with Mary until after Jesus was born. And the Bible thought that that was so important to understand Joseph's faith in the matter that it puts it in the scripture. Scenes 7 and 8 are together, the stable and the shepherds. Luke 2 says it this way, And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished, that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. And they were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were sore afraid. God used this universal Roman taxation to get Joseph, Mary, and Jesus to Bethlehem. They had to get to Bethlehem. Do you know why they had to get to Bethlehem? Because it was prophesied that, they would, that the king would come out of Bethlehem. So God used this incredible, you know, great government thing to get them there, likely because of the heavy travel patterns because of the taxation. The scripture says there's no room for them in the end. That's a whole sermon of its own. So consider that for just a moment. When you consider the harmony of the whole story, the son of the living God, the savior and king of the world, the prince of heaven, was born in some sort of stable or cave used by animals. How many of you ever driven down Wather Road up here, New York? wherever it is, up, yeah, where is it, been there? You ever, you ever seen the cows when the cows come home? You ever see that Mr. Wather has like 25 like uh, old bathtubs that he puts water in and some feed for these things? So uh, what if a bunch of us guys went and picked up one of those, asked Mr. Wather first, picked up one of those old bathtubs that, you know, he slops the, or whatever, feeds the cows with and whatever, and we just brought it up here and say, amen, there's a, there's the bed for Jesus. Humility, folks. They seem to, to stay in that stable for several days. And one of those nights in a nearby field, before the, as the baby's being born, whatever, after, there were common shepherds watching their sheep the glory of God shone all around them and they were sore afraid, which I, I think is quite literally, they were so afraid that they hurt. The angel told them that he was bringing good tidings. Okay, that word is our word evangelism. It's the word gospel. It is literally, we are bringing you good news, the gospel of great joy for all people. He told them that the Savior was born as a baby in a nearby town of Bethlehem, 
which was called the city of David. It spoke of a king being born. It was a very small town, maybe 300 to 500 people. I always imagined it to be bigger, but not at that time. The angel told them that the baby was a savior. And then he said, it's it's the Messiah, it's Christ, it's the Christ, it's the Lord. He told them that the sign of this savior was a baby swaddled lying in a feed trough. And then the entire night sky was overcome with a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill to men. Again, just these great proclamations of the whole world being changed. They, they came, the, the shepherds came, and they found it all to be true, and they left there and they proclaimed it. Think about the scene, folks. Get the harmony. Stable, feed trough, lowly shepherds. It all speaks of the lowliness and humili- humility contrasted with the great notable person being born. It's this great toggle thing going on. In many of the scenes, we see you know, great, majestic, amazing angels, and we, we sing about them in our carols, you know, this great all light, you know, this miracle, blah, 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 and then it toggles from the wondrous light, majesty, angels, to this low, the lowliest of situations that, don't make, that doesn't make sense or shouldn't make sense, to the lowliest of people who are involved in the scenes and, and the lowliest of situations you know, s- stable. You know. Scene number nine. The circumcision and dedication of Jesus. The circumcision and dedication of Jesus. Luke two twenty one says it this way, and when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angels before he was conceived in the womb. And when the, the days of her purification, uh, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. From his birth, even as a baby, Jesus kept the law perfectly. You know, the first deal being his circumcision. He was circumcised at eight days, according to the law. He was dedicated at the temple 40 days. Uh, A boy was dedicated 40 days. A girl had a different number. Uh, uh, According to the law at the temple, Jerusalem, when Mary and Joseph brought him, according to the law, they, they should have brought a lamb. That was the first thing. Okay, you bring a lamb. This is how you dedicate a new child. But there was a provision of the law in Leviticus chapter 12 that said, if you could not afford a lamb, you could bring two turtle doves, two pigeons, one for a burnt offering and one for a sin offering. And the interesting thing in studying this through, that it's always the same. Those two birds that were being brought the law specifies that one is for the mother to be cleansed, to be purified from her childbirth and all that happened there. The second one was for a sin offering of the mother. Even in this picture, Mary needed a sin offering, but not Jesus. Once again, we see humility in this scene. Financial poverty in offering the birds for an offering and spiritual poverty in needing a sin offering. The creator that gave life to every lamb, sheep, and ox that have ever drawn breath could not afford a lamb for his own dedication. Humility. Humility. While they were at Jesus' dedication at the temple, there was an older man there named Simeon. And this this is kind of a creepy part of it because he he comes and he, he actually takes the child. That's scary, you know? That's very, very scary in our day of thinking. Can you imagine uh, just uh, someone coming and taking your baby out of your, kind of your hands? But he does. He approaches them. He takes Jesus in his arms. He had been told by revelation, prophetic revelation, that he would see God's salvation before he died. The Bible says he lifted Jesus in his arms and basically said, Now let me die because I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people, a light for the Gentiles, and a glory for Israel. So here's this little newborn baby lifted up like this by this creepy old man that's a prophet in the temple. The Bible actually says that, you know, Joseph and Mary stood there, I think the word is amazed or shocked, but but Simeon, he wasn't done talking. He turned to Mary and he told her that this baby was set, it means ordained, for many, for many people, this baby is set, ordained for many people, to fall and rise again in Israel. That seems to speak of the humility 
of repentance. John the Baptist, prepare, your heart has to be prepared before you come to Jesus. Many will have to fall before they can rise again in Israel. Repentance and salvation of individuals. And, and Simeon said, and for a sign, this, this baby is ordained for a sign that will be spoken against. And of course, that's the sign of the cross. The cross was a horrible way to die. It, it, it indicted, it, it, it declared guilty those that were hanging there. The Bible says that it's a sign, a ne very negative sign, a very humble, negative, horrible reputation sign that Christ hung on a cross. Salvation would come by the humbling of Jesus on the cross and would expose the humbling, the Bible says, of repentance and faith in our own hearts. And that's hope. That's hope. And then Simeon keeps on going. And he says to Sarah, he, excuse me, Sarah, yeah, Mary. He says to Mary, a sword will pierce through your own soul. And I believe that he is speaking of the fact that, Jesus, that Mary watched Jesus die on that cross. And at that moment of seeing her son, her perfect son, her virgin-born son, the son of God, the son of the highest, die there, it was as, as if a sword went right through her heart. There was another older person there, 84-year-old, uh, widow, her, her name was, Mary, was Anna, and she prophesied also, and she immediately gives thanks to the Lord, began telling everyone who, are, who was standing around the temple, evidently, uh, that everyone here who looks for redemption, look to this baby of salvation. That's what she says. All you who are looking for redemption in your families, in your life, you know, for Israel, look to this baby of salvation. There's one last scene, scene number 10. If you're still with me, say Amen. Are you, are you guessing at the theme? Do you have the 10 words yet? All right, here we go. Scene number 10, of course, is the wise men, the wise men. It's in Matthew 2 and verse number 1. It says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is, is born king of the Jews? <clears throat> For we have seen his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. We really don't know how long it was, until these wise men came to the house where Joseph and Mary now lived in Bethlehem. They were no longer at the stable. They were in a house. Jesus was no longer a baby, but a young child, perhaps about two years old or so. God had provided a miraculous moving star, as you know, that they had followed from Persia or maybe some other eastern land. They had traveled many, many, many miles. They traveled for months, maybe even years. And they came to Jerusalem six miles away with great fanfare, seeking the king of the Jews. And it says that all of Jerusalem was kind of in a tizzy that these guys rolled in. Herod the king was a historic, violent, and extremely jealous tyrant who had killed many, if you go back and study him historically. Uh, he called the Jewish religious leaders to ask him, where is this Messiah supposed to be born? They told him Bethlehem, that's where the wise men went. And he instructed them to bring word so he could, air quotes, worship the child also when he finds out where the child is. Of course, his intent was to kill the child who threatened his throne. You remember that horrible scene that later on he kills all the babies, all the, the infants up to, I think it's two years old of Bethlehem. Well, the wise men came and they found the infant. And that star rested right over the house. And when they saw the infant Jesus, the young toddler, now, the scripture says that they fell down, these magi of some great worth. They're carrying very valuable things. They were, you know, they were not necessarily kings, but they were people who had come that were of notable report. And they fall down, they worship him. These wealthy and scholarly magi humbled themselves before Jesus. They gave him gifts of gold and of frankincense and myrrh, rare and costly gifts fit for a king, whole nother sermon on what the meaning of those gifts were. Of course, there's many different details that I let out of this story. But these are 10 scenes that give you the entire picture in one setting of what happened. And as we went through each one, I wonder if your mind found the overall theme of Christ's birth. I wonder what stuck out to you. This is what I see, and I'm going to send it up. I'm gonna, you know, there's many, many other themes of the Christmas story, but this is the big one that I see when I look at it all in one panoramic view, the whole story. 
I'm going to sum, sum it up for you in 10 words. God humbled himself to save all who will humble themselves. Let me say it again. God humbled himself to save all who will humble themselves. Every scene of the Christmas story that I gave you is laced with these identifications of this great, holy, amazing, powerful God condescending and piercing the the darkness of our sin and failure with the hope of his complete redemption and restoration. Instead of the wrath and the annihilation or damnation that we deserve, here he comes to rescue as the lowliest servant showing his nature of humility, of love, grace, and mercy. And this is what has been pounding on my heart in 2019 at this Christmas season. Why didn't he just come as an average man? Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying that he could have accomplished salvation just being a middle-class, average, blue-collar, right-in-the-middle kind of man who came in perfection and died on the cross. He could have accomplished everything, but he didn't do that. He went to the furthest extent of humility. Every scene is laced with this condescent. It's not that he's a man coming, it's he's a servant coming. It's not just a servant, a servant in, the, in the, the lowest scandalous position. He came lowly and humble. The king going so low in humility shows the embar- embarrassing extent of his mercy and gracious nature of love as he puts on the robes of a servant to treat us like the king. There's something more here, people. It's not that Jesus came just to To save the world. He could have done that not coming so lowly. But he chose to come lowly. He does not come as an average man. He comes scandalous, lowly, in poverty to show his great humility to invite you to be reconciled to him. And I want to show you what it's like. Randall, come. Stay right there. This is not what happened. God did not reach down to us and invite us to be saved. This is not the Christmas story. This is the Christmas story. Will you be reconciled to me? Do you get it? He became the lowliest. You can be seated. He became the lowliest servant to show his mercy, his love, his grace, his incredible humility of invitation. Will you be reconciled to me? I will get on my knees as a vulnerable baby in order for you to come and we can undone what was done so horribly so many years ago. The flip side of his condescension was found in all the other characters. That if we will see his humility and match it with the humility of admitting that we are awful sinners before God and that we are wicked and that we will repent. We don't want to live for that sin anymore. We must have what Jesus did for us. We must have the Savior. If we will match his humility with the humility of repentance and faith on him, we will be reconciled to God. We will be born again. Everything will change our guiltiness before him, our future, our destiny, our abiding by him as our reconciled father and wonderful savior brother Christ forever and ever and ever. When I look at this panorama of the Christmas story, the harmony to me is the humility of God and the necessary humility for us to meet him there. And he will save us. Would you bow your heads, please?